I spent the first 18 years of my uh, professional career working as a human rights lawyer, human rights activist, and that was until 1995. Since 1995? Well, since 1995, I've been involved in international peace processes, really conflict resolution in many parts of the world, which really emanated from the work that I did here in South Africa. I've worked in numerous African countries, spent five years working in Madagascar, and then many years in Northern Ireland and the Basque Country, and I've worked in the Middle East, and most recently I worked in Colombia whilst the FARC was in negotiations um, in, um, in Havana, Cuba. And in particular, over the last five years, how have you occupied yourself? Well, in the last five years, my focus has been uh, still in conflict resolution, but adding to that trust building between the private sector and the public sector, civil society and communities, but predominantly in the Southern African region. Where are you based currently, Mr. At the Curran? moment, At the moment, I'm in uh, Berlin, Germany. Um, I'm there, I'm a Richard von Weizsäcker Fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy, and that's a nine-month uh, uh, presence. And I'm researching there sort of international trends in private sector, public sector relationships, and how the quality of those relationships often reflect either political order or political decay. And if political decay, what remedies may be used to reverse that trend to build trust and mutually beneficial relationships between public sector and private sector? You've been present during the address in relation to the application today, Mr. Curran, and you no doubt heard of the two whistleblowers mentioned. Do you know those persons? I do. Um, I have engaged with them for, for many months. Do you know how, in their capacity as whistleblowers, from your interactions with them, how they feel about their personal protection yeah. I will, and integrity? Yes. Before I answer that question, I just would like to say that, I mean, these two people, um, I believe the country ho owes a huge debt to the state and the nation, because frankly, I think if it had not been for, for them, I wonder whether this commission would be sitting today. So I just want to put that on record. Um, in terms of um, their own fears, certainly right from the outset, when I first began to engage with them, they were very fearful. I understood that completely. There was a particular dynamic in the country, which I think we, we all are fully aware of, and that is really during the course of most of last year. And uh, that fear which, which they have uh, continues to, to exist. Right. Do you know uh, from your own knowledge whether that position might change in the future? Um, my, my knowledge is that uh, it will change, it should change, and I think it will change from discussions that I've had, but that will really only be during the course of next year, towards the middle of the year. And as you indicated in, in your address, there are reasons for that which maybe one would not want to go into. Um, but certainly, I think it's a question of certain existing circumstances changing. Let's then move, Mr. Curran, to the narrative. Well, uh, let's just summarize first uh, your evidence in this regard, if we may. Um, do you know how, through interactions with the two whistleblowers, they regard their personal integrity and personal safety. Just repeat that. Are they, what do they think uh, in relation to their own personal integrity and personal safety at this time? Well, they are fearful of their, of their personal safety. And that's really the reason, as I indicated, why they are not willing to testify at this stage. 
Let's then move on to the narrative. Um, it begins, as I understand it, early in 2017, February 2017, to be precise. What happened then? Well, as you indicated in your address to the chair, um, I was approached by a friend, long-standing friend and colleague uh, who I've known for, for many years, and uh, he mentioned to me that someone with whom he'd been acquainted for a relatively short period of time had spoken to him very confidentially about a hard drive in his possession. Um, I can't recall um, precisely what his description was, but I was certainly left with the impression that the content of the hard drive dealt with the affairs of the Gupta family and their corrupt relationship with uh, senior politicians and uh, state-owned enterprises. Thank you, Mr. Curran. Mr. Chair, if I may just uh, interject at this stage, Mr. Curran will uh, clearly, as he has done, repeat some of the evidence contained in the affidavit of Mr. Yes. Nombembe. What is important about this evidence coming from the mouth of Mr. Curran is that it's direct and yes. personal evidence. No, that, so that's if you would bear with us in that. Yes, no, thank you, thank you. So do you, you know then um, the name that we've attached or that has been attached to this person who approached your friend? Yes, that's Stan. And your friend? Uh, I refer to him in my in my statement as my friend because he too does not wish to be identified. Do you know why your friend then approached you? Well, um, my friend was approached because it, from what I gather, the Stan, my friend was the only person that Stan knew who worked in the sort of socio-political space and he felt that maybe this person might be able to advise him on what he, sh on what he should do with this uh, information that he, that he had. My friend uh, then, uh, who's known me for many years, felt that he wasn't capable, that he didn't have necessarily the expertise, the experience, the networks, the know-how, how to deal with this type of situation. And he felt somehow that, uh, that maybe I would be better qualified to provide advice and assistance to Stan. Do you have any experience, direct experience, of dealing with a situation in which whistleblowers require to reveal information and secure safety? I certainly, you know, just in broad terms, when I was head of lawyers for human rights, we, we actually even ran a witness protection program, which I don't mention in my written statement but that's something which I've sub subsequently recalled. But besides that, you mentioned Captain Dirk Kutsia, who, uh, as we know, blew the whistle on Flockplas, on the, the, their activities during the 1980s under the command of Colonel Eugene de Kock, who was then head of that secret task force C2, known as C10, uh, also referred to as third force and death squads. And just to mention that, uh, Captain Dirk Kutsia approached me as early as 1985, um, well before he became sort of public knowledge and he came out um, with, with information which he required to be kept, kept confidential for the first number of years. Did you then come to meet with Stan and your friend? Uh, my friend and I met with him a few days after um, I had been uh, approached by my friends, certainly during the course of February. Very briefly, would you relate to the chair what happened at that meeting? Yes. Um, I was introduced by my friend who was there as someone, chair, who could, uh, who could be able to advise and assist him. Uh, it was clear that uh, Stan had a need to offload, which is not surprising. Uh, since he'd been, possession, been in possession of the hard drive which he was referring to for many, many months, uh, undecided as to what to do with it. Um, and at last he had this opportunity, I think, to speak to somebody that, uh, that might be able to assist. Um, and uh, 
should I go on? Yes, please. Uh, although uh, Stan could not read all 300,000 emails, which he indicated there seemed to be, he had read enough of them uh, to be well informed about what appeared to him to be a corrupt relationship involving the Gupta brothers, Duduzani Zuma, he mentioned by name, certain cabinet ministers that he also mentioned by name, and some of the CEOs of major state-owned enterprises. He also indicated that the information on the hard drive uh, appeared to comprise emails from one Mr. Ashu Chola, who was, he understood then to be the CEO of Sahara Computers. Um, from your I mean, own observation, what was Stan's condition? Well, at that stage, he was visibly nervous. He was in a state of, of shock. One could just see that the man was, uh, was feeling uncomfortable. He was feeling uncomfortable talking to me. He'd never met me before. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a difficult meeting, but I think he got some level of reassurance from that meeting because then I continued. He, was, he continued to be willing to meet with me. And that was February 2017? That was in February 2017, okay. Chair. Did you learn how Stan came or had come into possession of the original hard drive? Yes. At that meeting? I, I did. Uh, he explained in detail how he came into possession. And, uh, I, you know, I, at this stage, I cannot reveal that because if I were to do so, it would be possible. It would certainly facilitate or enable uh, identification. Yes, I think we've accepted that it is necessary at this stage to protect the identity of Stan. Uh, the point, however, is that that information and evidence is available and may be placed before the Commission in due course, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yes.